All right, thank you. So our next speaker is Ben Gomont. Ben's gonna be talking to us today about small unmanned aerial systems for sharp-tailed grouse lek surveys. And Ben is a research biologist at the Hedinger Research Extension Center in Southwest North Dakota. His research is focused on the impact of land use on ecological services. Thanks, Ben, and it's all yours. All right, um, I can't tell, is my presentation up? It is not. It is not up, okay. It's, it was up, you just had it flash up. For a second? <laughs> yep. Okay. How about now? Not yet. Okay, and then yeah, just click at the bottom. There we go. All right. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay, well, thank you, everybody, uh, for listening in today. I'm excited to get to talk about some work that we did a couple of years ago. This is actually part of um, Alex Rochette's master's thesis. Uh, this was one of the chapters in his, in his thesis. And this work had to do with using small unmanned aerial vehicles or systems to try to survey grouse on sharp-tailed lex. Sharp-tailed grouse on lex. Um, our additional co-author for this uh, project was Dwayne Elmore, and he's from OSU or Oklahoma State University. Funding for this project was provided by the U.S. Forest Service and NDSU's Agricultural Experiment Station. So I think everyone in this group is uh, understands why we do wildlife surveys. We do them for a number of different reasons, uh, to develop some population trends. We might use them to uh, figure out exactly distributions or changing distributions of species. And it also can provide us with maybe an index of abundance of a, first, of a certain group or something that we're interested in. Uh, for the many reasons we do them, there are also uh, many different uh, methods that we use to conduct these surveys. And they all have their kind of pros and cons um, and situations where they're best suited to, to use. Uh, you know, point counts are often nice for passerines and roadside counts we use for passerines as well in the breeding bird survey, as well as we might look at ringneck pheasant um, populations or brood, broods along those survey routes. Aerial surveys are, are particularly useful. They uh, allow us to get into areas that of rugged terrain where we may not be able to, to get by foot or with a vehicle. And we can also cover uh, some, some area or territories quite quickly. But like the other um, methods, they also have their, their, pro, their cons, which for, for aerial um, surveys include, they can be very expensive you know, buying an aircraft, upkeeping the aircraft, hiring the pilot. And they also can be dangerous. You're flying through at low terrain, at low altitude sometimes through some pretty rugged terrain. So there are some, some shortcomings to those. Uh, recently, you know, in probably the last 10 years or maybe a little more, but more recently than that, small, uh, small unmanned aerial systems or UAS or UAVs are, are starting to be uh, used a little more just in general within the public as well as um, within some wildlife research. These uh, UAVs have come a long way as far as user friendliness. And they also, you know, we now have a set of rules that we kind of have to follow. So we, we know what we can and can't do with them. But although we're using these some for wildlife, I think there's, there's some potentially some great opportunity to uh, do some more things with these. But I think it's also at a uh, species level. So we have to figure out how different species are going to respond to the presence of uh, this UAV flying over their head, such as here the bear that flies off over and the bear runs off. If you were interested in counting that bear and before you could get there and get picture or video of it and it ran off, well, that's going to impact your, your count. Also, um, while some surveys we don't mind disrupting um, whatever we're trying to count, there's other times that we just don't want to be disruptive. So if this thing uh, disrupts what we're looking at, that might be something we need to consider too. So um, 
grouse, you know, we this our group had worked with prairie grouse quite a lot, um, and they're they're an interesting group. They're they're an indicator of ecosystem condition. They're species of conservation concern, and they're a lot of manpower and I guess woman power has gone into counting grouse uh, each spring. So both from aircraft, but also um, from road surveys. So there's a lot of effort put into counting grouse, but they might be very well suited for. Um, UAV counting them on their leks with UAVs because each spring, I think most of us know, they gather on leks um, to dance and attract mates. And these areas are usually on the grasslands, at least up here, up north here, uh, on grasslands that are relatively short in structure or vegetative structure and, and they want to be seen. So maybe we've got to thinking that we could use UAVs to, to count grouse. Um, Especially specifically sharp tails in the spring when they're when they're lecking. So we developed this project where we're gonna first we just want to know how they're gonna respond to this thing flying over their head. Uh, so our first objective was just to look at how they respond. Our second objective would have been um, and is how, you know can we get pictures of them? And then we also our secondary objective was we were very new to this uh, UAV stuff, this drone stuff. We've been working on it quite a lot more since this, but this was really our first project. So we wanted to be able to provide others that were just starting some idea of labor and the technical requirements and some of the logistical challenges. I probably won't talk a whole lot about that today, but uh, that is definitely something we were interested in. Our study area um, was in Northwest South Dakota. Uh, on the Grand River National Grassland. This is a, a wonderful place. It's got a lot of um, grassland cover left, not only on the National Grassland, but also the surrounding area as it's uh, used. A lot of the land use still involves grazing. So we've still got a lot of grass in this area. Very, pretty stable grouse population. There's a good number of good density of wex in the area. And for us um, at the research center, it's handy. It's about 10 miles. Uh, we're in North Dakota, but it's about 10 miles south of, of where we're located. And we have a very good working relationship with the Forest Service, who was also interested in this, this data because as many of you know, they count grouse each year on the left. So um, when we first started this, we kind of worked with some other folks. Uh, we didn't have our own uh, drone. None of us were licensed uh, early on. We, uh, one of my technicians became licensed and then Alex became licensed to fly these. But one of the drones that we had, uh, that was easily that we could have, that we could use was the DJI Phantom 4 Pro quadcopter. So that's the one we did our research with. It's pretty user-friendly um, until probably recently and maybe even still, you can just buy them over on the shelf. We used the camera that it came with. So whatever the sensor was, it was a 20 megapixel, uh, just a camera to take pictures with. We laid out flight paths um, over each lek. So the, the drone would go back and forth over the lek. We would launch the drone from about at no closer than 200 meters away because we didn't want that drone taken off to affect the behavior of the grouse, uh, at least not at first. Um, we flew these, uh, we flew, flew the, the UAV over the lex at a couple different altitudes. So at 30 meters and also 121 meters. The 121 meters is about as high as the FAA will allow you to fly the, 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 the UAV above the ground. So that's top end there. Prior to uh, us flying each lek, uh, right before, a few minutes beforehand, I would, I would run out, get to a vantage point, and observe the birds at the lek for 15 minutes prior to the, the drone taking off. Then I would observe them during the, while they were, the flight was occurring, and then for 15 minutes afterwards. Early on, before, I would just be counting birds and monitoring their behavior. Are they dancing? Are they just standing around? Kind of what are they up to? And again, how many were there and males and females. Then when the, the, the UAV approached, I would observe the birds and, and see whether they kept dancing or how, what they did if they stayed on the lek, if they acknowledged the drone, so they heard it or whatever, they saw it and they looked up and they either ran for cover or they stopped dancing or they flushed, they just fly away. Sometimes just a few of them flushed or was it a complete, um, complete flush? We looked at uh, things like, we you know we include a random variable in, in our models for each leg, but we included all kinds of weather variables, temperature, wind direction, wind speed, um, 
the date that we did it. We just included a lot of different variables into the model that we collected while we were in the field. And um, we did some modeling and we came up with the best model set that we used AIC and 95% confidence intervals to AIC to evaluate the model and 95% confidence intervals kind of evaluate the, the variables. At the time when we launched the, um, the, the UAV, you, we needed someone, you need someone there to, you got to keep a visual on the UAV. So we not only use the flight, the pilot, um, but there was also someone there keeping an eye on, on the drone. So what did we find? Um, well, we did our work in 2018 and 2019. Uh, we, our flights were done between nine April and three May. And for up here, that's, you know, that's right during pretty peak or a lot of the, the grouse dancing, uh, lecking activity is occurring. We did our 43 flights at 19 different lek locations. So roughly each year, each flight, each lek got flown over once and a few of them got flown over uh, more than that annually, but for the most part, just once. On average, we kept our flights to about eight minutes. So included getting there, conducting our surveys and then flying back. Um, our LECs had about six males per LEC and about one female per LEC visit. So of the 43 total surveys that we did, 14 of the LECs, all the grouse flew away. So they completely abandoned the LEC. They, it was, they were disrupted and they flew away. Of that, um, you know, so after that, after they flew away, um, this is what happened to those 14, the, at those 14 LECs. So post-survey, eight, Lex had birds come back to it. And on average, that happened about four minutes after the, the quadcopter left the area. Uh, during the survey, we had one group come back or one bunch of birds come back to the LEC. And then we had five, uh, we, five during five flights, they never returned. I will say that uh, I think at least three of those last flights where they never returned were done. Later in the morning, we stopped flying at 9.30 a.m. Uh, mountain time. And I think that the birds there were probably just about ready to be done for the day anyway. The dance was almost over. So of the 29 leks that we monitored where the birds did not flush from, uh, so once the, the, the UAV left the area, five of those leks had birds start dancing again within three minutes. The UAV was still present. And during the survey, 10 of those leks, the birds just kept on dancing. Three of the leks that immediately following the survey, the birds started dancing again. Five of them, they never started dancing again. And at six leks, the birds weren't dancing before the lek, uh, before the before the flight, and they never started displaying afterwards. So many of you know have monitored leks before. You know, there's just some days where it doesn't seem to be happening, but the, the boys are still there. So um, as far as our modeling efforts go, uh, we found that wind and um, altitude of the, of the UAV influenced the probability of whether or not we could even get near grouse or whether or not the probability of grouse flushing. So at the lower altitude of 30 meters, grouse, they, they flush quite frequently um, regardless of the wind. But at 121 meters in this kind of sweet spot there around eight to 10 kilometers, uh, per hour of the wind at 121 meters, the birds were, were staying put most of the time, but not all the time. It was never 100%. So we did a little better at greater elevations. But as you notice, as the wind, uh, a, a low wind or a light wind and a, and a higher wind um, definitely impacted the way the birds behaved to the UAV. So altitude, you know, we can only fly at 121 meters. And even at that height, we still had birds that would flush. So, so there's, there's still some issues there. But at 121 meters, using our, our camera that came with the drone, we're simply unable to detect birds on the leg. These pictures were taken in our patch burn grazing, a different study um, on post CRP land. And these are stuffed are grouse in the circles there, stuffed sharp tails. And at 30 meters, you know, they're still visible if you blow it up, but 120 meters, even at 300%, you just cannot see the grouse anymore. So despite them flushing, not flushing all the time at altitude, we certainly would need to look at a different camera, which I do believe those sensors exist. Now, as far as wind goes, I was out there observing these leks and at a light wind, a lower wind speed, you could hear um, that drone coming from, from quite some distance away. Uh, there's no wind to hide it. And those grouse would just look up quite 
quite quickly. And um, of course, they, they, these drones look very much like aerial predators. So a hawk and hawks and eagles are, are in, uh, these things are huge predators to sharp-tailed grouse, probably one of their biggest. And they're particularly vulnerable on the leg. So I imagine they looked up and saw this thing that looked like a hawk and, and flew away. On the other end of the wind spectrum, so in heavy winds, we used a quadcopter. And when that thing would, would hit the wind, it, it would kind of have to rev up to keep on a straight line. And when that thing would rev up, the grouse would hear it. So you, you could really hear it rev or when it had to bank to turn to go back towards the left during its survey. When it would rev up like that, the, the grouse would respond. And that seems to be when they, when they would also flush. But there was that spot right in the middle where it seemed like the wind probably helped in masking the sound or the noise associated with, with our drone. As far as just some quick things with our secondary objective, um, these things are safer, of course, than manned aircraft. Uh, they're just not, I mean, we, since we have to be able to see them in the distance, they're not gonna take the place of manned surveys, but they're lower cost, of course, than having an airplane or, or a helicopter. So there are some, some potential things here. Uh, Alex and both Dan got their licenses quite quickly. Um, there are, I think there's some potential here for, for these things to be used. Surveys are very easy to replicate. Once they're on replicate, once they're on your computer or your device that's talking to the, the UAV, it just flies them. Um, indeed, this particular UAV had a, a fail-safe mechanism that I think you know really helped us and would made it user-friendly because one time I was watching a lek and the drone flew over and it flushed the grouse a little bit and then it just took off heading east. And I mean it just went. It was looked clearly not on any path we'd put it on. And I don't know if Alex figured it out or if the machine figured it out, but it eventually landed and where we could just go get it. But it, it, is, it is fairly user-friendly and it has some um, stuff in it that helps make it user-friendly. I do think that the, the current FAA restrictions as far as being able, having to be able to see it all the time and it being, um, and only being able to fly to 121 meters probably restricts what we will be able to do, at least in the short term. So I do think there are sensors out there at higher, meter, uh, higher elevations or altitude that would allow us to see what was going on at the bottom. Sometimes in the grassland, we would get some uh, weak satellite connection between the, like the UAV and the, the mom, the person driving it, but that didn't seem to be a huge deal. Sometimes just some funny things would happen. And battery life, you do have to be aware of that. These things can drain batteries. Uh, relatively quickly. One thing I would add in, um, you know, this, we used the DJI, DJI, and since then we've purchased a couple of them, but I, recently I believe, and I know that these have, you, they've ended up on some kind of a federal or a government ban list almost, or blacklist. Uh, these are made in China. So I don't know going forward how that's going to impact all the research and um, what we can do, but if you're interested in buying a new drone, you might want to think about that and perhaps look elsewhere, which is unfortunate and, because that's some good stuff. You have about one minute left. Okay, so altitude restrictions are gonna hurt us, I think. We'd like to fly higher. Um, I do think there's a lot of opportunity for these uh, UAVs going forward or UASs in terms of not only logistics, we can do it, we can fly them relatively quickly. They're easy to take care of, um, but we do have some work to do as far as um, how a different wildlife is gonna respond. We'd like to try some different platforms. We've been messing with that a little bit. And again, if we could fly in a greater elevation, that would be great. So uh, this is a great project. We had a, a lot of fun doing it. And it was one of those projects that was pretty much fun all the way through. So again, this is Alex Richette's uh, master's work. And I put his email up there. If you're interested, you can email him. He's learned a lot more since then about it. And if this work interests you at all, it was published, uh, I think last March in Wildlife Biology. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Really interesting. Um, would you be able to stick around a few minutes for uh, questions over chat? Yes. All right. Thank you, Ben. All right. We will move on to our next speaker. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Bruce Eichhorst from SDSU. He's going to be presenting.